So, so first of all, thank you, Michael, for these very kind words of introduction. Thanks also to you, um, Josef Puchter, and all the people involved to really organize this uh, event. And I must say thanks to you all. Um, if you look outside, the weather is so great. And um, I see this, this crowd here. I must say I'm really amazed. I want to thank you already in advance. I hope you won't regret at the end of this afternoon mm -hmm. that you came. And the story I would like to tell you, as the title already infers, is the discovery of a virus, or actually the history of the virus. What this word? It's mute. Okay. Never be too shy. <laughs> <laughs> At least not always. Um, a, a story that is essentially the history of a virus, so to say, which is the hepatitis C virus, starting off with the discovery of the virus until a disease, so to say, which we nowadays can cure in 95% plus of the patients. And the history of hepatitis C virus, starting off with the discovery, is tightly linked to the trans blood transfusions. So let's say once upon a time when medical doctors did blood transfusions, in about 30% of the cases, they were causing a so-called transfusion-associated or post-transfusion hepatitis. That means every third patient who received blood developed a liver disease. So nowadays, this would, of course, not be acceptable, but this was reality in the years before 1970s, roughly. And the main reasons were, first of all, the blood that was used for the transfusion was given by paid blood donors, and most often these people were essentially earning their fortune for this purpose, and often they had a lot of risk factors. So that means there was a high prevalence of those hepatitis viruses amongst those blood donors. And the second one, of course, was there was no possibility to diagnose hepatitis virus infection. And once that was discovered, mainly by Harvey Alter, when the paid blood transfusion was abandoned and replaced by volunteer blood donors, and uh, first test to diagnose hepatitis B virus infection, the prevalence or the incidence of transfusion hepatitis plumped down from 30% to roughly 10%. And the better the antigenic tests became, the further down transfusion-associated liver disease went until it reached something like 5% transfusion-associated liver cases. And based on the exclusion that this was due not to hepatitis A and not to hepatitis B, the pathogen responsible for that was called the non-A, non-B hepatitis. And the, of course, the biggest challenge then was to identify molecularly this pathogen, this non-A, non-B hepatitis. And there were many challenges to that. First of all, there was no serological assay available, so it's very difficult to diagnose and to identify something that you cannot detect. And the second reason one was there was no way to propagate this pathogen in cell culture. So essentially, you had to identify this by kind of blind screening assays. However, in the early 1970s and 80s, it was possible to transmit this pathogen by experimental infection of chimpanzee and in using a hepatitis demonstrating the Cox postulate that there is indeed an infectious pathogen causes a hepatitis. This pathogen could be inactivated by treatment with organic solvents, and that means obviously this virus or this pathogen, this virus needs lipids. That means it's a so-called enveloped virus. Um, a very specific feature was when people looked in the infected cells, they identified distinct membrane changes. It was a small pathogen, strongly associated with lipids, and very importantly, it was possible to induce neutralizing antibodies and those antibodies could then be used for blind immunoscreening assays. And so the assumption based on these criteria was it's probably a small RNA virus. And in those days, this was where the days where you could not buy restriction enzymes simply by ordering. You really had to make them on your own. It was quite challenging to molecularly clone this pathogen. And finally, in 1989, the group of Mike Houghton and his team at Chiron Corporation, which later was bought by Novartis, 
They were able to identify a very small piece of a nucleic acid, which a clone they called 5111, which laid the foundation for all the diagnostic tests to diagnose non-A, non-B hepatitis. They used this as a probe and finally could identify molecularly the clone, a cDNA clone, which they called then the hepatitis C virus. And when they did comparison by bioinformatic analysis, they found indeed this virus has a genomic organization which is very similar to another RNA virus, the yellow fever virus. And yellow means in, 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 in Italian, eh, sorry, in, Ita in Latin, the flavus. And that's why this family is called the Flaviviridae. And hepatitis C virus was then classified as a member of the Flaviviridae family sharing very similar genomic organization. And once this uh, molecular clone had been identified, blood screening tests were implemented, first generation blood tests, and you can see that the incidence of non-A, non-B hepatitis post-transfusion <coughs> dropped down dramatically, second generation tests, and last but not least, nowadays routine in blood banks, nucleic acid-based testing, and essentially the, the chance or the risk to acquire an hepatitis C in the course of blood transfusion is nowadays virtually zero. So that demonstrated that the molecular clone they had identified indeed is responsible for or causes this non-A, non-B hepatitis, and that essentially laid the ground for all subsequent work. With this knowledge, it was possible to develop diag further diagnostics. It became clear the virus is spread throughout the world. It's prevalent pre in pretty much any country. In Germany, we have a prevalence of roughly 0.5 to 1% of the normal population, but there are hotspots like, for instance, here in Egypt, where roughly 15% of the population is HCV positive, which in that country is due to the fact that people were treated against schistosomiasis, which is an infection by a worm, with a drug that had to be given by needle injection, and the needles were simply not, cha not changed, but simply reused, and in that way, this, uh, this viral infection has been spread throughout the population. So it's really prevalent all over the place. It's highly heterogeneous. We nowadays know six different genotypes, and they have different regional prevalences. All around roughly 130 to 100 million people are chronically infected with HCV. In Germany, roughly half a million people. And still every year, we have roughly 5,000 new diagnoses up to today even though um, we have this diagnostic test. And the reason simply is most infections are asymptomatic. They have a very long incubation period from the infection to end-stage liver disease. And that's why we have many undiagnosed people who don't know of their infection and more or less either by having a severe liver damage or because as an as a, uh, observation by chance, they realize they have a chronic hepatitis C. Now, the majority of infections with HCV becomes persistent. This is very unusual for an RNA virus. Normally, RNA viruses are acute, self-limiting, so you have the infection, then it's gone. Think about, for instance, a rhinovirus, a common cold. Uh, in this case, we have a virus that, in most cases, gets chronic, most often asymptomatic, and depending on comorbidity factors, such as alcohol consumption or high body mass index, people can progress more or less fast into a liver cirrhosis and cirrhotic patients have a high chance to develop a hepatocellular carcinoma. And to give you an idea on the burden of disease, roughly one quarter of all hepatocellular carcinoma cases are linked to infection with hepatitis C virus and until recently roughly one quarter of all liver transplants have been conducted because of a chronic hepatitis C. And this is again shown here. So um, since we are here in a liver, uh, in a cancer center, uh, just to remind you, hepatocellular carcinoma is really a serious uh, cancer. It has a very poor prognosis. It's the third most common cancer-related death. And 75% of all hepatocellular carcinomas are linked to viral infection, 25%, as I said, to hepatitis C virus, which we nowadays can cure and 50% of them to hepatitis B virus, which we still cannot cure. So obviously, there's a lot more to do in the future. Now, coming back to the history, as I told you, uh, Mike Howden and his team had essentially developed the first molecular clone of HCV. 
And in that way, they have established the blueprint of the genome map. And so I would say from the discovery to cure, we had to walk along essentially three steps. The first step was to unravel the genome organization and to characterize the viral proteins. So this was the blueprint that Mike Houghton provided. It was just a single HCV clone. And based on the work of many, many lab also including ours, it became clear it is a so-called plus trend RNA virus. That means the RNA is directly infectious. It has just one gene. And this gene encodes a so-called polyprotein, which means a protein precursor that needs to be proteolytically cleaved by cellular enzymes and by viral enzymes. And this polyprotein is cleaved in 10 mature products. And only when these 10 mature products have been formed by the proteases, only then the virus is able to replicate. And there is a quite interesting complex regulation of that. I don't want to go into the detail. One important aspect is all the viral proteins are bound to intracellular membranes. That means the complete viral replication cycle happens on the surface of intracellular membranes. There's nothing floating around. There's no nucleus involved. Everything is membrane bound. So that means whatever the virus does to the cell, it has to do it by starting off at intracellular membranes. Now the next important step, once we had an idea on the genome organization of the virus and the viral proteins, was to establish cell culture systems. And what you, the easiest way what you can do is you take sample from a patient. Let's say, for instance, you take serum from a patient and you throw it onto any kind of cell line you have in the lab. And then you try to measure viral replication, for instance, by TACMAN, by qPCR, quantitative PCR. And this never really worked. It was extremely inefficient. And if you got a signal at all, it was nested PCR plus a southern blot. So maybe there was most likely no replication at all, just input RNA that was measured. Also, very surprisingly, even when we and others were taking infectious molecular clones of HCV that were infectious in a chimpanzee, they were unable to replicate in cells. And this was work that kept us busy for roughly five years until we finally gave up. And we, I mean especially Volker Lohmann here, uh, the mastermind in setting up the cell culture system, we essentially said we will never be able to detect replication by doing qPCR or something like that. We need an RNA independent measurement of replication. And for that, we came up with the idea, and this was essentially borrowed from poliovirus, of so called subgenomic replicants. And when you compare the, the organization of the viral genome with the organization of such a replicon, you can see this region here, which we assumed is only required to build the variants, but not for replication. We take this out, make it smaller and thereby more efficient, but at the same time we create space. And the space we use to insert a resistance gene. And the idea was simply, Whenever this RNA is replicating, the resistance gene is co-amplified and the cell will become drug resistant. And this really works as the <coughs> in the following way. You take these replicon RNA, so you make RNA by in vitro transcription, you put it into cells, and when this RNA does not replicate or the cell does not have this RNA, and then you, when you then add this cytotoxic drug, the cell will simply die because it has no resistance. Second possibility, the cell gets the RNA, but the RNA replication is so low that the copy number of the resistance gene is not sufficient to withstand the cytotoxicity of the drug. Again, the cell will die. And the third possibility, when the RNA is replicating efficiently, you have a high copy number of this resistance gene, and this cell will survive. And this selection is really the most powerful way you can do. And this finally worked. And what we've ended up, and this were one of the very original plates that we obtained, where we transfected roughly 10 million cells and did this G418 selection. We ended up with 10 to 20 G418 resistance cell clones. So very inefficient. And so we thought maybe this is just dirt or crap. But, never, but our, our technician, Uli Herian, in the lab, she is very talented in handling crappy cell clones. Um, she picked these clones and expanded them into cell lines, and to our great surprise, 
all the cell lines contained high amounts of viral protein and viral RNA. So this was really, I would say, the clear-cut starting point because of this very high efficiency. It was now very easy to measure viral replication. And of course, it was very easy, easy to mess up with the replication. What is the aim you are doing when you want to develop antiviral drugs? Because these replicants contained all the primary drug targets. There is a protease here. There is an NS5A factor. There is the RNA polymerase. And whenever you block any of these factors, you can easily measure that in this replicant system. And this was really the starting point of the whole drug screening purposes. Now, from an academic point of view, it was very clear, since we obtained out of 10 to the 7 cells, only 10 cells that were really able to survive this election, this whole system had a serious bottleneck. And the bottleneck was that the RNAs, the HCV RNAs, as they were replicating in the cells, they had to undergo or to acquire mutations. And some of these mutations, in fact, we found many of them, they were boosting the replication quite dramatically. And when you take some of these mutations and put them back into the original replicon, all of a sudden, you don't end up with 10 cells, but all of a sudden with 10,000 cells meaning that now the system was very, very efficient, also now allowing to do really simple drug screening purpose and whatsoever. The downside of this, whenever we were putting these mutations back into a full genome, we got nice replication, but we were unable to produce variants. So these mutations that enhance replication were at the same time suppressing virus production, and the conclusion of that was we need a novel viral isolate, an isolate that is able to replicate to high levels without the requirement for such mutations. And this was essentially a holy grail in the field, which was finally discovered by Takashi Wakita, a colleague in, in Tokyo, who had identified from a, a particular HCV isolate, which is called JFH1, because it was isolated from a Japanese patient with fulminant hepatitis. And when he took this isolate, he made exactly the same replicon design like ours, puts it into cell, all of a sudden, instantly, he got the plate full of colony, meaning this, rep this RNA was extremely efficient in replication and did not require such mutations. And so we teamed up with Takashi, and Thomas Pitchman in my lab, he followed that up together with Takashi. We then made the full JFH genome, and without going into detail, indeed, it was possible possible to produce infectious virus from this isolate. Very simple, you take it, you put it into cell, it's replicating and spitting virus out. Very inefficient, however, but then we were again busy in improving that system and Thomas found a specific variant, a chimera, an engineered virus, which he put together called JC1, which is uh, nowadays very widely, widely used in, in, the, in the tissue culture lab which gave us infectivity titer in a normal range for a virus. And with that, I would say we had really could enter the classical virology field for hepatitis C virus. And with all these tools together over the years, the, the basic principle of the HCV replication cycle could be identified. It's starting off with a complex entry mechanism into the cell. The RNA is released into the cytoplasm. Then the viral proteins are made at the ER membrane. The virus is then building up a membranous replication factory, which has a very specific um, morphological feature. In this membranous replication factory, the viral RNA is amplified. At some point, it's packaged into the virions, which are then released out of the cell. Now, instead of telling you each and every detail of that, I would like to show you a really nice movie that my colleague Francois Panin has made that you can find on YouTube and which I highly recommend for any kind of lecture you have on RNA virus, which is this one, the hepatitis C virus life cycle, which shows you here the structure of the virion. It's a lipoviral particle. It has a high lipidic sh shell. These are the envelope proteins. These are apolipoproteins. So we are now sectioning the virus. This here inside, this is the so-called nucleocapsid. This is the core protein, a basic protein that is binding the viral RNA genome here within the virus particle. And this virus then is binding, or via the bloodstream, is binding to the surface 
of hepatocytes, and there are many, many factors involved. You can see these are the envelope proteins. Now the virus is traveling. In fact, it's trafficking to so-called tight junctions within a cell, and then it's undergoing receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now we are looking from the inside of the cell. This is the so-called clathrin. Now the virus is coming into the cell and is ending up here in the endosome. It's now docking to dynein. It's being trafficked along the so-called microtubules until it's reaching an area close to the ER. The clathrin code is removed. The virus envelope is fusing with the endosomal membrane and then the RNA is released into the cytoplasm. So this is essentially the very first step of so-called entry. The viral RNA is then in the cytoplasm. The ribosomes can directly recognize it because it's a plus and RNA. And then translation goes on here at the ER membrane. And the viral proteins are all stuffed here into the ER membrane where they are residing. As I said, everything happens on the surface of an intracellular membrane. So the structural proteins and the replicase proteins. Then the virus is inducing massive rearrangements of the ER membranes. These, these guys that are coming out of the ER that we call so-called double membrane vesicles. And they are accumulating here in the cytoplasm. So this is the structure of such a replication vesicle of the virus. And they are forming this membranous web. And here on the outside or the inside of the RNA there the viral RNA is amplified. So this is the viral replication machinery. You can see in a 3 to 5B. So this is what we use to build up the replicants. Then the, minus, the plus strand RNA is copied, and then a, a, a minus strand copy is made. It stays together. You have a double-stranded RNA, and then the minus copy is amplified multiple times to make new plus strand RNAs. And that's the way the whole RNA genome is amplified. Then this genome has to be trafficked to so-called budding sites, which are areas in the ER membrane where the virus is really going into the ER lumen. So this is the core protein, this is the viral RNA, this is the budding process, and then the virion is essentially ending up in the ER lumen. So we are now looking in, we are sitting now in the ER lumen, looking what is coming from the ceiling, so this is the virion as it is coming. These are the envelope protein. This is the apolipoprotein E from the host cell, which later on becomes part of the virion. And then the virus is essentially ending up in the ER lumen. And once it's in the ER lumen, it's following a so-called vesicular transport. And the vesicular transport goes then through the Golgi, the multivesiculated bodies. And finally, the virus is released out of the cell by a non-cytolytic pathway and exocytosis, and finally is then released into the bloodstream. So that's essentially what we are knowing so far about the replication cycle of HCV. And as I said, if you're interested in that, you are certainly welcome to, to uh, take this U uh, YouTube video. Now this is one aspect what we know about HCV in its basic parameters. What do we know about HCV and um, liver cancer? This is much less well explored for a very simple reason. We do not have immunocompetent mouse models. So it's not possible to propagate HCV in mice. So everything you can do is essentially based on stuffing proteins into mice or using artificial systems. What we know most likely, the major driver of pathogenesis is a chronic inflammation. And this chronic inflammation is driven by an immune response that is attacking infected cells but unable to clear the infection. So you have a destruction of hepatocytes that is ongoing for years and even decades in a chronic hepatitis C. And then also, again, depending on cofactors, especially DNA damaging cofactors, you have the accumulation of mutations that can manifest then because replication space for such damaged or altered hepatocytes is created, and then you have eventually the development of a hepatocellular carcinoma. So this, I would call, is a really indirect effect, mainly driven by the chronic <coughs> inflammation. However, there's also evidence that the virus can directly induce liver cancer. For instance, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with a chronic hepatitis C is greater as compared in an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. 
indicating that the viral infection is doing something special. HC, hepatocellular carcinoma does not always require cirrhosis, and importantly, there's also evidence from transgenic mouse models that certain viral proteins, like for instance the core protein, can induce at least neoplastic lesions in specific mouse strains, indicating that in addition to this indirect effect, the virus is also inducing more direct cancer um, contributing uh, pathways like lipid pathways and so on and so forth. And last but not least, there have been really interesting studies conducted in the last year indicating that specific viral proteins can also interfere with distinct tumor suppressors like, for instance, the microRNA-122 or the famous RB protein. So obviously, tumor formation is a mix of indirect and direct effects. Now, in the last part, <clears throat> I would like to elaborate now, going back into the history, um, how did replicants and all the cell culture systems finally provide the way um, to develop all the highly efficient antiviral drugs? Now, there is one very important aspect that has to be kept in mind, which is very often forgotten when comparing um, or asking the question, why is the cure rate in hepatitis C so high? and it's so low in hepatitis B or in herpes virus or so. There's very ob one very obvious reason, and this is the virus does not integrate, so the nucleus is not involved in the replication cycle, and the virus does not have a stable reservoir of persistence where it could hide. So it cannot hide somewhere in the body or in a specific niche of the cell. The virus has to keep up its persistence by constant replication, and of course, that what you can conclude from this is it should be possible to eliminate the virus if you are potently enough inhibiting the replication because the virus can't hide anymore. And this, in fact, is the main reason why the antiviral therapy is so efficient in hepatitis C. It's, of course, also the, the high power and the high potency of the drugs, but it's also the simplicity of the replication cycle why the cure rate is so high. And the three main drugs that emerged by working both in vitro and in cell-based assays are the NS3 protease, an NS5A replication factor, and the NS5B RNA polymerase. And so that means we nowadays have three classes of antiviral drugs. And for the experts, they already can uh, realize from the last, um, um, from the ending of the word, what kind of cl drug class that is. The protease inhibitors always end with Previa, like Telaprevia, Simeprevia, uh, Boceprevia. The 5A inhibitors always end with Asvirs, like Daclatasvir. And the, four, the polymerase inhibitors always end with Buvia, like Sophosbuvia. So that's very easy to uh, memorize then just by looking at the brand name. Okay, this is inhibiting this or that. And pretty much all the drugs that are given nowadays are combination therapies of at least two of those classes. So let's first take a look at the protease. Now the protease was one of the first drug targets. Why? Um, actually, when I was starting my postdoc work at Hoffman La Roche, they had just finished a research program on HIV, and for that they had developed Saquinavir, which is a protease inhibitor, which was by that time close to being uh, entering clinical trials, and so they were looking for new opportunities, new research directions. And um, they were kind of fixed on protease because it worked so well for HIV. So saying, okay, let's take a look. This virus also should have a protease. Indeed, it had, but it turned out it's not really the best drug target. But nevertheless, we were working a lot on characterizing this protease, and it turns out it's a heterodimer. It needs two factors. One is N3. And the other factor is an NS4A viral cofactor, and only then the protease is active. But the big, big disappointment came when the X-ray crystal structure was solved because it turned out the so-called substrate binding pocket, which is the site where you would like to dock an inhibitor, was extremely flat. So what you usually would like to have is an enzyme with many canyons and clefts and all sorts of surface where you can nicely dock in an inhibitor because then the inhibitor has many grips. However, the way the HCV protease looked like was really a very flat surface. And you can compare this, for instance, with this free climber, 
So this would be the surface of the active site of the protease, and this is the inhibitor. And obviously, this inhibitor has a hard time to stick to its target, and with a bit of blowing, it probably falls off. And so pretty much the same was also with the protease inhibitors. It was very difficult to dock something. It just came off. So the KD was unfavorable. However, and this is just one example I would like to give you um, how these drugs have been developed. What people f observed by doing very detailed biochemical analysis was a so-called end product inhib inhibition. What does this mean? Once the enzyme has cleaved its substrate, this portion here, the so-called C-terminal region, remains tightly bound to the active site of the enzyme, causing an auto-inhibition. And what you can then simply do, so this is the peptide as it remains bound. So what you can simply do, you take this hexameric peptide as a lead structure, and then you start to do medicinal chemistry. So you derivatize like hell with all sorts of side chains. So this is the original hexameric peptide, and people did several thousand or hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many, um, uh, chemical modification. And what they finally ended up with was this guy here, Tenaprevir, one of the very, actually the very first protease inhibitor that was finally approved in the clinic. And when you look at the structure of Tenaprevir and compare it with the natural substrate, you can clearly see this is still a very much a peptidomimetic. It's just derived from the natural substrate, based on the observation of end product inhibition. And later on, additional protease inhibitors have been developed. Originally, they were only approved in combination with interferon. They had a lot of side effects. Many people had to stop treatment. And nowadays, with the third generation protease inhibitors, they look much more complicated, much more sophisticated. It's nowadays also possible, because they have a higher barrier for resistance, to use them in interferon-free therapy. And for instance, this protease inhibitor has already recently been approved in the US, and this one about one and a half year ago in the US and Europe. The second major drug target, I would say the best one, is the NS5B polymerase. So it's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And there are two classes of inhibitors. One are the so-called non-nucleosidic inhibitors. That means they bind to the enzyme and just inhibit it. And they have a very low barrier of resistance. So you can rapidly get uh, uh, resistance. And that's why only one of this class has been approved nowadays, the Sabuvir. But this can only be given in a triple combination therapy because you rapidly select for resistance. The drugs that are much better are the so-called nucleosidic inhibitors. And the most famous drug is this one, Sofosbuvir, which has been developed by Michael Sophia. Um, and he put a lot of emphasis that this name is really engraved in this brand name, Sofosbuvir. And this is really a very interesting drug. And it's interesting for the following purpose. When you look at it more closely, you realize it's a uridine analog. So that means it's taken by the polymerase and incorporated but it causes a chain termination. But the important point is, it's given as a monophosphate. And the reason for that is, when you give just the nucleoside without a phosphate, the, the conversion from the nucleoside to the monophosphate is extremely inefficient. And this is always the bottleneck with this kind of drug, uh, drug, uh, with this kind of, uh, drug class. And by providing already the monophosphate, they cause, uh, overcame and avoided this major bottleneck. Now the problem when you give a phosphate as a drug, it will not enter the membrane. So you have to neutralize the charge of the phosphate, and that they did by adding all these hydrophobic side chains. And they were designed in a way that once it's taken up by the liver cells, liver enzymes are very efficiently cleaving off these modifications here, and then converting the monophosphate into the triphosphate. And as soon as the triphosphate has formed, it is unable to leave again the cell because it's too much charge. So it's really a trapping of this molecule in the liver, so you accumulate high liver levels. And this, of course, is very favorable for the antiviral therapy, plus another chemical trick I don't want to go into. This drug is also famous for its, uh, for its market entry. In fact, the drug had been developed by a small biotech company, which is called Gil uh, Pharmacet. 
And this was a company, I think 50 or 100 people. Uh, the team was led by Michael Sophia. And um, based on clinical trials with a total of 200 patients only, a big pharma company, Gilead, was uh, taking the bet and was spending 11 billion US dollars, 11 milliarden, uh, just for this drug, hoping it will pay off. And uh, indeed it did, um, for several reasons. First of all, it's pan genotypic. It doesn't matter which virus you have. It's active against pretty much all the virus variants. There's pretty much no resistance because this drug is targeting the active site and mutations at the active site are killing the enzyme. It's well tolerated. And what they also found, it's well combinable with NS5A inhibitor, and this is now one of the major cornerstones of the antiviral therapy, Havoni, or more recently, uh, initially Sovaldi, and later on now this Havoni. So this is really uh, an amazing thing, but there was also a lot of negative press, because by the time this drug was introduced into the market, the costs were roughly 1,000 US dollar per pill, and you had to give this to a patient for 12 weeks, one pill a day, so the doctor was certainly not allowed to drop the pill on the floor. Uh, the health insurance for sure would not reimburse that. So that was a lot of hype and, and uh, a lot of negative also criticism on the company. Um, but from an, an, uh, an economic point of view, within the first year, they made something like 19 billion US dollar charge from this single drug. And in that respect, it has really by far the most successful drug that has ever been introduced into the market. Mm -hmm. So the last uh, drug target I want li would like to briefly mention is something that people never had on the radar for a simple reason. Usually you, you would like to target an enzyme because then you know what your enemy is and what kind of drug you want to develop. This guy here, NS5A inhibitors, they emerged from random high throughput screens by using the replicants that we had developed. And the amazing point is the potency, picomolar activity. So usually a drug has an activity in the, let's say, single digit nanomolar range. These guys were working in the single digit picomolar range, so a thousand fold more active. And this was really amazing. Um, raising first the question, what is really the drug target? And by selection for resistance, they found it is NS5A. But the most striking thing was from this phase one clinical trial, just with a few patients that were given single doses with low or with a very low or low, medium, and high dose. And you can see in the 100 milligram group in patients, when you look here at the time scale, these are hours within 24 hours after drug treatment the virus titer dropped by a factor of 1,000. And this virus titer stayed down for a week of follow-up, even though the patients had been given only a single shot of the drug. So this was really spectacular. And I must say, this is another interesting uh, story. And there are many of that kind. Um, this drug had originally been identified by many similar drugs by many, many companies. And they were always scary not to follow it up because they had no clue what the drug target is. There was only one company uh, which was um, headed, not the company, but the team by Mingao. Uh, they were encouraged enough to push this forward. And as soon as they had shown this on meetings, uh, people went back home digging in their freezer and reactivating their NS5A programs. And then all of a sudden, the companies within a year had 5A in, five inhibitors in their clinical trials. So for instance, Gilead, who spent 11 billion for the Sophosbovir, they had no clue about NS5A inhibitors. But once they saw this, they went back and immediately combined their 5B inhibitor with 5A inhibitors. And now they are, I would say, they are dominating the market because they can offer everything in a single pill because it's the same company. So for us, the question was, what is the mode of action? <clears throat> so what is the mode of action? I can't go into the details. Um, there is at least a double whammy involved. One is the viral replication factory. This membranous web is pretty much inhibited. It does not form anymore by the drugs. And the second point, the infectious virions um, are no longer assembled. And that's why you have, let's say, with one drug, two different drug two different modes of action. 
which might explain the high potency. So all these drugs have steadily increased the so-called sustained viral response, and sustained viral response is pretty much nowadays identical with virus elimination, so we cure the early or the late 19, uh, early 1990s, where we had no clue about the virus, the only way was to treat patients with interferon, which is just stimulating the immune response, and now as of 2014, we have interferon-free treatments with a cure rate of 95 to 100%, and uh, this is pretty much across all the different genotypes. There are only a few exceptions. So that raises the questions. Before I come to the end, are we at the end of the road? And I would say certainly not, and there are many reasons for that. First of all, when you think about a global eradication of the virus, there is a constant discussion ongoing whether it will be possible to eradicate hepatitis C just by treatment. I would say this is a theoretical possibility, but history has said, um, has told us, when we think about a global eradication, we should have a vaccine. And um, so I think this lady is wrong. For hepatitis C, we do not have a vaccine so far. We have it for hepatitis A, B, and D, but for sure not for hepatitis C. And since the antiviral therapy is so potent, the interest of pharmaceutical companies to pursue in a vaccine develop is pretty much close to zero. Um, so this is certainly one major obstacle. <coughs> the second challenge, I would say, is what I already mentioned, the price. So nowadays in Germany, the treatment costs roughly 55,000 euros. So if you consider we have half a million people infected in Germany, if you would like to eradicate hep C, you have to spend 500,000 times uh, 50,000 or 60,000 euros, and then I would say our health insurance system is collapsing. So this is just not possible. But even let's assume if you're living in a country that can afford the treatment, your chance to get rid of the virus is close to 100%. But when you look on a global scale, that means where hepatitis C is really prevalent, so far we have cured roughly 1 million out of the 130 million to 170 million people. So that means on a global scale, pretty much nothing has changed. And as long as we don't have, or people don't have access to the drugs and don't have medical care to take care of that, this will not change in the future. The other challenges, screening and linkage to care, that means what I already mentioned, uh, many people don't know about their infection, so they can transmit it, although very inefficiently in normal cases, but there is the risk. There's also, by the way, the risk to be reinfected, to be reinfected even when you eliminate the virus by treatment. The costs are already mentioned, and for me as a basic scientist, there's a lot of interesting unsolved questions with respect to the molecular and cell biology of the virus, with respect to its pathogenesis, for which we definitely need better Baus models or in vivo experimental models. Now on the last point, the very last point, there are also new opportunities that emerge from the availability of these drugs. And one interesting observation that Robert Timmer, a long-standing collaborator of us, has made is shown here when he was looking for the T cell response against viruses. So what he did was he used, he isolated T cells from patients with a chronic hepatitis C. And then he was asking the question, do these T cells still respond to viral stimuli, like influenza, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, or hepatitis C? And what he found, the T cell response against all these standard viruses that we pretty much all have or had is normal. However, the T cells are unable to respond to hepatitis C, indicating that the virus is inducing or suppressing a specific T cell response against itself. And the interesting part is what happens now to the patients when they are treated with the new drugs. So Robert found these CD8 T cells have a so-called exhausted phenotype. I think you all know about this from cancer treatment. However, when when people are now treated with these potent drugs, and you will uh, hit pretty much everyone to get virus-free, those T cells start to gain their proliferative capacity, <coughs> indicating that T cell response comes back. And so I think this offers now a new opportunity to really look for the reconstitution of an immune response against a well-defined antigen, in that case the hepatitis C virus, 
in infected patients, and I think this is even better than a mouse model. Obviously, also the DFG was convinced of this concept, and for that, we got a collaborative transvideum network, which is also uh, a joint venture, including several groups of the DKFC. With this, I'm now at the end. I would like to acknowledge all the people. The name list is just too long. This is taken from a retreat. I think it was in 2014. I would say roughly one third of the people have already left. But thankfully, we have one third replaced. So we are kind of in a steady state. I would like to mention especially here this person, Volker Lohmann, who is also here in the audience, who was really the main person to set up the Replicon system. There were many people involved for all the subsequent studies to really understand the replication cycle of HCV. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, my funding sources, has already been mentioned, the Chikan Heinz Schaller Foundation, who really made it possible to come back from Mainz here to Heidelberg, also the Manfred Lautenschläger Stiftung, who two years ago provided a great donation, I would say, free of any strings, uh, research money. And I heard, I'm not sure whether that's true, it might also be possible to express a wish. And since the Vorstand is now here, I would like to express my wish. And the, the wish I have has nothing to do with money for me or for my research. It has something to do with, let's say, um, strengthening infection research, infection, inflammation, and cancer here in, here in Heidelberg. We do have the research program F, infection, inflammation, and cancer here, currently 15 research units. We do have a very strong department of infectious diseases uh, currently hosting something like 28, maybe soon 30 research group. We already have a lot of joint activities, joint research groups, joint affiliations. We do have a couple, and the list is growing, of joint research grants and research networks together. We have joint seminar series, even in the major infectious diseases we are collaborating. Uh, I think um, so far we have quite some input in this direction, and um, what we would like to sustain and increase is the input in that direction, which of course requires continuous support for the restructuring and rejuvenation of research program F. And I think with all that together, we can create much better synergy as we did in the past. And I think this would clearly be for the benefit of both sides. Thank you.